What's up, everyone? Welcome to episode 29 of Preloaded. My name is Josh Finderup, and I'm joined, as always, by the other half of Preloaded, Jackson Vanover. How are you doing this week, Jackson? I'm doing great, Josh. I'm really excited to you know talk and get into our show this week. I'm excited to be excited about Bethesda again. Yeah, we literally just got off of uh, the computers watching the showcase that they put on. I don't know if it's a showcase, the roundtable discussion that Microsoft had with the Bethesda studio heads. And there's some exciting stuff to come out of that. We also got some other news this week about uh, some more Xbox news. We got some Naughty Dog news. So there's uh, definitely some interesting stuff you want to stay tuned for. But first, we do have one announcement to make regarding how the show posts. Usually we kick off the show by saying you can catch it on both of our YouTube channels. Well, there is a change, and that is that it is no longer going to be posting on my channel for a variety of reasons. Hopefully, this isn't a huge inconvenience to our audience. Uh, It's definitely not the place where most people are getting the show. So if you want to watch Preloaded, you will now have to get it on Jackson's YouTube channel. And again, we hope this isn't a big inconvenience, and the show has always been identical on both channels, so there's literally no change to the show just where you will watch it if you were getting it on my channel. And by the way, if you were watching it on my channel, we've posted 20 episodes there. Just thanks for the support there. Uh, But now you will have to go over to JV on YouTube, J-A-Y-V double E. So that's the, uh, if you want the video version, go there. If you want the audio version or you want to listen, you can get it at Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Stitcher. No changes there. If you are listening on any of those platforms, we'd love for you to subscribe there and give us a rating if you enjoy the show. Uh, Drop a five-star review or let people know why you like listening in a written review. You can also write into Preloaded at the email address preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. We welcome all of your comments, all of your feedback, but we'd love to get your questions. At the end of every show, we dig into our mailbag, read one of your questions right here, and discuss our thoughts. So if there's anything you want to hear us talk about next week, again, write in to preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And with all that out of the way, we are going to kick the show off as we always do with our segment, What the Hell Have You Been Playing? Jackson? Yeah, Josh, this uh, week has been the week where I've played way too many games. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go down the item list, uh, spend a no little... No such thing. <laughs> I guess that's true. That's true. It depends on who you ask. Um but for me, I um, I actually went back to the Outriders demo, and it just completely changed my mind. I think I was being a little childish with my impressions, saying there was nothing good about Outriders. Um, I really appreciate a lot of the good things that it does in the looter shooter genre, and I appreciate that it's unapologetically itself. Um, it's not big for no reason, like massive open world. Everything you do is very confined and tight. It's about the gameplay or the gunplay. Uh, the loot is very friendly. It matters at low levels rather than like Destiny where you have to play the game for 20 hours before you get something that matters. So I really like a lot of what it's doing. Also, it's not an endless experience. That's something I really appreciate. They're saying it's going to have end game um, content on launch, but this is a 35 mm. hour game that you're going to enjoy for the 35 hours, but it's not live service. So That's stuff that I really appreciate. I wanted to talk more about that because I've been very, very vocal about how I didn't like it. Um, I I really do like it now. and It's crazy to have that 180. Um, That's cool. Yeah, man. It feels feels good. Um, I just, yeah. I'm like, keep going. You're doing great. Um, (laughs) So (laughs) outside of that, went back to Immortals Phoenix Rising, was just surprised by how fun that, that game still is. It's just fun to pick up and play moment to moment. It's just fun. I don't know what else to say. Yeah. Yeah, I love that game. Are you playing the base game or did you touch the DLC at all? I'm still in the base game, man. I'm still only about 12, 15 hours in. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot to that game. You've got a ways to go. I know. I need to keep playing uh, when I get some time. But um, I've dove back into AC Origins and I'm just sucked into that game since I've kind of come to a close on Valhalla and how I feel about it. I've been obviously going back to the older games and 
Um, Origins still feels like my ideal version of the new Assassin's Creed games. So it's kind yeah. of like a little bit of mix of uh, what it used to be before we got to kind of Odyssey, which fundamentally changed things, which a lot of people love. And then yeah. Valhalla is like another version of Odyssey is really how I see it. Um, so it's been good to kind of play that and contrast it with the other games. Nice. And then, um, yeah, I've got too many things on the list. The last thing I'm going to say is... Hey, take your time. Go okay. for it, man. Okay. Um, Watch Dogs Online. I went back. Josh, did you have a chance to check this out? It just launched. No, I have had the itch to play Watch Dogs, but more for, again, the single-player campaign, which I never experienced. But uh, I'm curious to hear how the multi... Or the, the online. I shouldn't say necessarily multiplayer goes. Yeah, man. Um, it's it's just very much like the single player. And I suppose that's probably a good thing for a lot of people. Um, for me, though, it, it didn't offer enough things to truly just kind of get me excited and get me back into it, which just signaled to me that it's not my kind of game. So um, yeah. I, I think for people that really liked Legion, oh, yeah, you're going to love online. I think you're going to have a blast. Um, and you can even experience this stuff without communicating with other people at all if you don't want to. Just mute your nice. mic, mute your party, and hop into four-player, you know, co-op stuff. So, very cool. Yeah. Well, uh, you have been busy. <laughs> I sure have. Yeah. I'm interested to hear about your uh, your games. Um, so I have played two games recently. One, I jumped back into Hitman Three because they had uh, one of their elusive targets dropped with their you know content drops. I don't know if you've ever played an elusive target in the Hitman games. This was my first time. And okay. These are so they they make special contracts for you to take on in pre-existing levels, the levels that already exist. But with a elusive contract, you only have a set number of hours where it's available. I think they're available for like 96 hours or maybe it's a full week. Okay. If you miss it during that week, you can't go back and try it. Once you do try an elusive target, you only have one shot at it. So you can't try twice. If you die, you can never try that elusive target again. It's, it's over for you. And once you get into the level, they don't show you where the targets are. It's not like you have this, this, the stories to go. And even if you get into your, um, I forget what they call it in Hitman, but your uh, kind of your sixth sense mode, right? they don't show you where the target is at all. You literally got to just find them on your own. Wow. So I did that. That's incredible. Yeah. What was your experience? Um, I didn't like it as much because okay. I found one, there were actually two targets in this particular mission. I found one right off the bat and it was fun to figure out, you know, where he's going, how am I going to kill him, all that. But the second one, this took place in a Hitman one level. So I had to get I had to refamiliarize myself with the level and I was like I couldn't find the second one. So I had to look up online to see where the second target was um rather than just aimlessly wander this level. So I kind of wish that they gave you some hints, but it's a cool concept for sure. Uh, I would definitely recommend it if you're looking for more Hitman content. They have another one coming up in March. I'm not sure when it is, but uh cool stuff there. And then I started my I I you know, dove deeper into my stealth uh, exploration here, and I started a game called uh, Shadow Tactics Blades of the Shogun. Are you familiar with this game, Jackson? I am not, no. So it's a top, it is kind of an obscure game, uh, at least compared to like Hitman and Dishonored and these other games I've been playing. It's a top-down, real-time stealth strategy game, and it is awesome. It gives you these like uh, missions. It's unlike a lot of real-time strategy games, there's no multiplayer here. It's just single player. It gives you these missions, drops you in to these sandboxes, and you're a samurai. You also have four other playable characters. They each have different abilities. You have to combine their abilities to figure out how to get through these levels totally stealthily. Like It is a 100% stealth game. If you uh, confront enemies head on, you will die. Oh, and awesome. they're just these little sandboxes that you work your way through, and I'm absolutely loving it. I do kind of, in some ways, compare it to a 2D hitman, um, without it, but instead of like the disguises you instead have these five different playable characters that you can mix and match their abilities. Like one is a sniper. One is this uh, like young girl who sets traps. This other is a shogun. So he's like a ninja. And then you have a samurai. And I, the fourth one, the fifth one that I haven't played, I think is another woman and she can like seduce men, you know, to distract them. So really cool stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Sounds really cool. Um, it is, yeah. I'd highly recommend it. It's called uh, Shadow Tactics, Blades of the Shogun. The developer has also made another game that got excellent reviews called Desperados 3. So if, that's like a more Western oh, theme. Oh, yeah. So. I, I, that, yeah. That definitely rings a bell. Yep, yeah. So very cool stuff. Uh, if you're into stealth, I would highly recommend it. It's very challenging, though. This is like hard. They call them hardcore stealth games, and they are not joking around. That's so. That's super cool. I'm going to check it out. Yeah, so that's what we've been playing. We uh, have been playing a lot, apparently. Uh, with that, we are going to move on to our top stories, and we got some some big ones 
this week, uh, starting off with the approval of the Microsoft slash Bethesda merger. I should say the acquisition of Bethesda or ZeniMax, I think it was. They just said at the beginning of the week, this has, well, they didn't say, I guess the European, some organization in Europe basically approved the deal and that enabled it to go through. And then they announced that they were going to have some sort of uh, online event to kind of summarize what happened here. And that's what happened today. That's our second story is Microsoft held a round table discussion with Bethesda. If you're watching this show, you probably also watched this event along with us. And there wasn't any real, I didn't take any anything away from this, Jackson, that was hard news. Did you? Um, I, I will say the one thing that Phil... Um, Phil Spencer said, I do think is hard news, um, at least the way that people are uh, reacting to it about exclusivity. Yeah, so there was, and I guess there was the announcement of all the games coming to Game Pass, but yeah, so this was very interesting. Phil Spencer said that, and I think I'm getting a direct quote here, that he said that Bethesda games that don't have control, well, okay, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase, Bethesda games that don't have any contractual obligations that would uh, lead to anything otherwise will be exclusive on quote platforms where Game Pass exists. Right. That to me says that future Bethesda games are going to be Xbox and PC exclusives unless Game Pass gets put on other devices. Right. I, I think that's absolutely the case. And um, he had a little bit there as well. Um, it, it's actually slipping my mind what he said um, specifically, but he said along the lines of we wouldn't have made this deal otherwise in a very just logical sense, which I I really appreciate the way Phil Spencer speaks because it's, it's just very matter of fact. I mean, sometimes he does kind of uh, talk in generalities, but at the same time, they wouldn't have made this deal. They wouldn't have spent $7.5 billion, however much it was if they did not plan on doing this. And so um, I, I think you can actually go back at our old shows and there we did suggest, or at least I remember myself suggesting that, hey, maybe only the big titles, you know, those are st- will still be, cro- uh, you know, multi-platform and so on and so forth. But it seems like generally as a community, people have kind of come together and realized, oh, my God, they spent that much money. I mean, of course, this is going to happen. Yeah. And I think that that investment uh, financially was to, I mean, I, I don't know what they're thinking over there, but to me, it would just make sense that their goal would be to grow their platform, not mm-hmm. just to make money but to grow their platform in the long haul. And that's what's going to make them, if they're successful at it, that's what's ultimately going to make them more money in the long haul anyway. But that's the way I see it. And I do think that, you know, these older games, these legacy games, if you can get Skyrim on your PS4, that's not going to change. Uh, If they have, you know, Ghostwire Tokyo and Deathloop on PS5, that's not going to change. But it did seem to me that if you're looking at like Starfield and Elder Scrolls 6, those might not be on PlayStation 5. Yeah, I think I think you should I I think we should actually expect that. Um, Yeah, me too. Personally. And I I wanted to actually rope this in. We have our mailbag segment, but Josh tweeted um, right before we hopped on. Not Josh. um, Brock. 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 Yeah. Fan number one. Brock um, tweeted at us and said, do you see any reality um, where Game Pass suddenly appears on on uh, PlayStation? And I would just flat out and say no. Um, I, I really don't see that as a reality. And, and, you know, Phil Spencer did toss it out there and say platforms where Game Pass exists. But in reality, I think when you're talking about what's possible, there were whispers about Game Pass coming to Switch. That didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and, and we know why. I mean, I think Bethesda is just trying to strengthen their ecosystem. And as much as we kind of see them now as, sorry, Xbox. Um, as much as we see them as, you know, bring games to everywhere for as many people as possible, that's true. And they're investing in cloud and all of that stuff. But and man, they're trying to strengthen their ecosystem. Totally agree. Yeah, I think that's what they want to do. And it's not necessarily about Xbox. It is about Game Pass. So um, right. I don't th- I don't. Yeah, I, there's another complication to that. I don't want to spend too much time on it. But, you know, if, if, if Xbox or if Game Pass lands on any consoles that already have a bunch of those games already, like a Switch or a PlayStation, like, how do you handle that? Like, how do you handle the fact that people could play Game Pass or people could play Dishonored 2 on Game Pass for 10 bucks a month instead of buying it off their place, off the PlayStation store? That's a whole other bag of worms or can of worms. But uh, 
um, it does make for a complicated situation. So I agree with you. I, I tend to d- not think that we'll uh, see that future come to fruition for better or worse. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So uh, some other news that came out of this, we mentioned there are 20 games that are going to launch on Game Pass tomorrow. By the time this podcast launches, you'll be able to see that. They have released the list. Uh, it's pretty much all the games you'd expect with the addition of some old Doom games, some uh, the old Elder Scrolls games, all the way back to Morrowind, which is cool. Um, and then a notable omission. I don't know if these two notable omissions that I don't know if they're already on Game Pass or not is The Evil Within 2 and Wolfenstein The New Colossus weren't on this list. Not Yeah, yeah. And one more I'll add is Fallout 3 is not on this list, which is interesting yeah. to me. Yep. So uh, for whatever reason, but still cool that these are coming to Game Pass. And we also they also mentioned that a lot of the backwards compatible Bethesda games are going to be getting an F, a frames per second boost. We don't know which ones those are. And they alluded to the fact that there's some sort of summer event coming up, which I don't think is a surprise to anybody. And we'll probably learn a lot more about stuff like Starfield at that event. Absolutely. Yeah. And they were um, just pretty transparent about that which is great um we learned nothing about starfield from this event is one thing i want to say and some people were expecting that um didn't happen but also the fps boost is huge in my book i think it is just so incredible that they're able to go back and boost this stuff um, for next gen consoles so for example man running fallout new vegas on a console it's just pretty rough to be honest, yeah. to be very blunt. But if that, for example, gets a frames per second boost, that's just going to open up a whole new experience for people that might have jumped into the series with Fallout 76, for example. Yeah, and Oblivion is another one that I think might get a new audience if it looks as good as it possibly can. Uh, <laughs> maybe it doesn't need a new audience. I'm one that never played that game. but um, Oh, I cannot wait to jump back into Oblivion. Yeah, so that was the Xbox event. We did get some more Xbox news this a week kind of slid under the radar, but on a podcast called the Iron Lords podcast, which I've never listened to, Xbox program director or director of program management, Jason Ronald said, quote, not all games that are releasing this year have been announced. So there are still some games we apparently don't know about uh, that are coming to Game Pass or not Game Pass, but Xbox this year. And it did seem like he's talking about exclusive games potentially. Did you catch wind of this, Jackson? I did not, um, but I'm trying to think exactly um what that could be and it's it's i'm just kind of drawing a blank especially i I tend to focus on larger things so like what immediately came to mind when i read this is fable but i do not expect Mm -hmm. in any reality that fable comes out this year personally yeah and i wondered is it are there any games that they had like they've already announced fable are there any games that we just don't flat out know about and if they're if those are the games he's talking about i would think that they're smaller scale titles but right um it'll be interesting you know Aaron Greenberg, who we saw on the uh, show today, he said prior to this show that there's nothing coming soon as far as new game announcements. So anything that does come, we'll probably hear about this summer. Right. And I'll be you know, really looking forward to that event. It sounds like it's going to be <laughs> like very exciting if you're an Xbox fan. Yeah. And uh, the next two stories, I'm going to try and get th- through these relatively quickly so we can get to our deep dive discussion, which I forgot to mention at the top of the show. We're going to talk about our favorite Bethesda games. So that'll mm-hmm. be fun. But The next two stories, Naughty Dog is apparently hiring for The Last of Us Part 2 multiplayer. Now, I have seen some people tweeting, what's Naughty Dog working on next? Well, it's no secret they're working on a multiplayer multiplayer component, I guess you could say, to The Last of Us Part 2. That might even be a misnomer. This could potentially be its own game, but it does take place in The Last of Us 2 universe. We've known this for a while. They're now hiring for more people to bring on to this. And Neil Druckmann has said that they are working on something cool and with what they did with i'm not a big multiplayer guy but i did love the last of us part one's multiplayer so i think this could potentially be very cool yeah um i'm really excited for it um since i did not play the factions mode i'm just curious um how would you kind of generally characterize that as is it just kind of is it similar to the uncharted multiplayer mode that existed um yeah it was i mean kind of when you take a step back and look at it it was pretty standard like pvp um like i'm trying to th- like deathmatch okay sort of mode but they they had this really cool system and i'm having trouble remembering exactly how it worked where you would like build up stats and it it, it even involved your f- at the time this was a long time ago your facebook profile and your friends on facebook i think who were playing the last of us were somehow like roped into your multiplayer 
experience. <laughs> I'm probably totally butchering that because wow. this was like t- this was like eight years ago or whenever the game came out. But it was they they had a really cool innovation there. And then it just felt like a game I could get good at, which is so uncommon for me when it comes to these multiplayer PvP modes. Gotcha. That sounds really cool. Yeah, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. So, given that um, this, I think that was called factions, and this is also I think going to rope in some of those ideas if I remember, you know, the old quotes that Neil Druckmann had about this. But don't don't actually quote me on any of that. Yeah, in any case, I'm I'm really excited to see. Uh, judging from the, I mean, the quality of The Last of Us Part Two, I will be playing whatever they put out. Yeah, yeah, should be cool. And then lastly, uh, on a totally different note, Square Enix announced this morning that they are going to be having their own digital event uh, to promote their upcoming games. Uh, most notably, Life is Strange. Apparently, they're going to have a world premiere for the next Life is Strange. This is not a new chapter. This is a whole new game, apparently. And then they're going to talk about Outriders. Marvel's Avengers, the Tomb Raider 25th anniversary, which there has been a kind of a leak that there's maybe some sort of uh, collection coming out with the new games, uh, or I should say the rebooted games. Uh, then there's going to be some mobile games, one from Square Enix Montreal and a Just Cause mobile game. And then finally, Balan Wonderworld, which I think the hype for that game has kind of uh, gone down significantly since they released the demo. Uh, and that is what we'll be talking about next week, most likely. Yeah, I think, I mean, there could always be bigger news, but yeah, I'm excited to check this out. Yeah, so stay tuned for all of that. With that, that was actually quite a bit of news. We are going to take our first break, and when we get back, we are going to get into our deep dive discussion to go through our favorite Bethesda games of all time. Stay tuned. And we're back. We are now going to talk through, in light of all the Bethesda and Xbox news, our favorite Bethesda games of all time, and we're going to go back and forth. We each have our top five, or at least that's what I have, Jackson. Maybe you have a top uh, ten or something, but do you want to do top five, or what What are you thinking? Yeah, let's do top five and um, start at number five. Awesome. Uh, I will hand it right over to you. All right, here we go. So number five for me um, is actually going to be Prey, and the reason I've got it on this list, and I'm talking about the most recent one. I know there was an older Prey. Um is that I think it's severely, severely underrated. I think it's an incredible... They've got some very unique concepts, and I just appreciate Arcane's level design and approach to immersive sims. That's why I'm really excited for Deathloop. But um, I think Prey didn't get the love that it deserves, and I really hope that um, more people play it now that it's going to be on Game Pass. I absolutely want to play Prey. It was underplayed, and I'm one of those who didn't play it. But every time I see that footage of like a coffee mug or a roll of toilet paper rolling around, I'm like, I got to play this game. Oh, <laughs> it's it's so good, Josh. Yeah, yeah. Well, this list uh, showed me more, I, I think, games I haven't played than games I have. Prey is one of them. But for my top five or for my fifth favorite game of all time, I'm going way back to a game they talked about today, actually, and that's Morrowind. Uh, this was the first real open world game I ever played, even before, you know, Grand Theft Auto 3. Uh, it was one of the first computer RPGs I played through. We're talking over 20 years ago, I think. Uh, just that world just totally sucked me in. Uh, and at the time, it was just staggeringly beautiful. Of course, if you go pl- back and play it now, that's not. But uh, really a groundbreaking game when it came out. Yeah, I've heard so many great things about Morrowind. But I personally have never played it. Um, it just kind of released too early, I think, in my video game you know, existence and, and interest in it. Yeah. Um, so for, for number four, I'm going with Doom 2016. And I was kind of grappling with whether I wanted to put Eternal on here, but I think 2016 is more memorable to, memorable to me because of how shockingly good it was and how mm-hmm. it was kind of a return to form. Um, but I also think it kind of strikes a level of simplicity that I think was perfect. Um, Eternal makes things a little more complicated, which is why I think a lot of people didn't love it as much. I'm not, I don't want to speak for everyone, but anyways, for me... Um, it just represented the absolute purest, most um, just like the essence of what a first person shooter should feel like and, and the aggression and um, um, all of those weapons, just just everything about that game. I could brag about it all day long. I thought it was fantastic. Yeah. Doom 2016 is the example I, I give out when I'm talking when I talk about games that uh, try to modernize themselves mm-hmm. while staying true to the source material. I think they struck that perfect balance there with that game. They really did. Yep. So number four for me is actually Dishonored 1, uh, which I recently played through. And the reason it's not higher is I'm still kind of waiting to see if it, you know, my high on that game is if it's just like I just played it and I'm like, oh, this game is so good. And it is great. But um, 
I'm not sure I'll feel that way, especially after playing the second one, which I haven't played. Anyhow, great stealth in this game. I love the stealth. I did not play it high chaos at all. I might go back and try it that way, but um, I just love the options the game gives you, the different ways you can go through each level. Um, I wasn't too into the story, to be honest. Just the level design and the gameplay just totally hooked me. Uh, uh, going back and retrying levels if I felt like I didn't see everything. Uh, everything I like about good stealth games, this um, this game had it. Right, and it has... Uh, did you pick up that it has a little bit of Thief DNA, at least? At least that's what they were oh, going for. Oh, for sure. For. Okay. Yeah, um, and because I played the Thief game, the only Thief game I played, I played after Dishonored, so I, I wasn't thinking that when I played, but yeah, okay. having played a Thief game, I can absolutely see it uh, in this game. Awesome. Yeah, it's funny you mention... Um, Dishonored, because number three for me is Dishonored 2, um, mm-hmm. which I know some people will disagree, but I, I just, I appreciate everything that Dishonored 2 um, really pushes forward on that franchise with. Um, and I think it's a technical marvel, number one. Number two, I am obsessed with the aesthetic of the game. Um, I love the art style, just whatever kind of weird, funky, I think they call it whale punk, which was mentioned mm-hmm. today on the stream. Um, they just push that to its absolute limit and the environments are just stunning and gorgeous and it kind of represents the the perfect um, immersive sim, um, in my opinion. There's just so many things you can do. And like you, Josh, I really want to go back and play High Chaos because I'm one of those people that will also try to just perfect a level. If I get it wrong, reload, just keep trying and trying and trying. I really want to just kind of go crazy because there are some insane uh, abilities in Dishonored 2 that I haven't even tried yet. So yeah, I can't. I can't wait to get in. And uh, after researching Deathloop, there's a lot. There's some abilities in Deathloop that were in Dishonored 2 that weren't in Dishonored 1. So I've kind of gotten a little bit of a taste. And I'm also excited to play Death of the Outsider. I have that as well. I got it on sale recently. So awesome. Lots of stuff to play. Um. So I will say number two, or I'm sorry, number three and number two for me are pretty much interchangeable. These are not really ranked. I couldn't decide which order to put them in. But for number three, we'll say Wolfenstein: The New Order. Um, I absolutely loved this game. I was kind of on a, like, I just didn't really like first person shooters all that much that my, my, I should say my, my enjoyment of them went downhill. And then I played Wolfenstein, the new order. And I feel like machine games just nailed for me. What a first person shooter, a single player, first person shooter experience should be like really well designed levels. Um, the combat was good. This, even this game had some stealth options that you could take advantage of. And the story was really great. I love how they didn't shy away from the violence uh, in Wolfenstein dealing with Nazis. And, you know, it it just gets pretty gruesome. But that helped build this world for me. And um, I just love Wolfenstein. BJ Blaskowitz is a fantastic character. Um, Really cool stuff. (laughs) Awesome. Yeah, man. Um, Those are great games. Um, I, for number two, picked... The Elder Scrolls for Oblivion, actually, which surprised myself. I'm not a huge Elder Scrolls guy, but like when I go back and think, um, I was trying to pick one Elder Scrolls game to put on this list first off, and obviously I thought about Skyrim, but Oblivion is so much more memorable to me because it represented the first time for me where I got lost in a massive first-person RPG um, console experience. And Oblivion just sucked me in. Um, <laughs> I have so many fond memories of spending so many hours, you know, before I would like hop online and try to like look up the best thing and how to do this and that, like when it was truly a player driven me only experience, um, mm-hmm. it, it just sucked me in and did not let go. And, uh, I spent so much time struggling in those oblivion gates, but like I, I loved that entire experience. So that's why it's two for me. That's awesome. Yeah, that's one that I, like I said, I, I totally skipped and I feel like I'm missing out. And, you know, I, just the time commitment makes me apprehensive to go back to it. But I do feel like I missed out. Yeah, so, it's worth it. Yeah. Uh, for me, number two is Doom Eternal. So I had a tr- I had trouble deciding Doom 2016 or Doom Eternal. I agree with you on the simplicity of Doom 2016. It's so focused. But what I liked about Doom Eternal was it expanded on some of the exploration elements that I really like from Doom 2016. How when you get to the end of the level, you can go back and kind of like teleport back to different parts of the level to pick up maybe some collectibles you might have missed. And I really liked how they have they introduced the new farming aspect to combat where you have to kind of farm your shields, your health. And there's a third one that I'm forgetting. Um, Oh, God. Uh, Your fuel, I think. Yeah. Yeah. For yeah. Maybe that's what it is. But anyways, 
kind of added the strategic element to the combat. So it did complicate things, but for me, it just made it for it made for such engaging firefights in that game. Um, I, I really love Doom Eternal, and um, I hope that it is going to um, follow that up with a third in the series. But we will see. They haven't. They've been pretty mum on that. But love Doom Eternal. Yeah, man, me too. It, it made my um, my top games of the last year list. So um, really enjoyed that experience too. Nice. Um, so for my number one, I'm actually cheating a little bit here. Um, <laughs> of course, I would pick a Fallout game, but I, I'm going to give it to three and New Vegas because I think they're so similar. Um, mm-hmm. But New Vegas is kind of the superior version, I would say, of the game itself. But I prefer the... Um, kind of the world and the quests and stuff of three. Uh, but they, they're so, they were released within like two or three years of each other and they were so formative to like what I love about games. Um, like genuinely getting lost and immersed in a world and also just, I think it was uh, formative for me loving kind of sci-fi in general, actually, even though it's like a very specific kind of sci-fi. And yeah. Also, uh, just dark, uh, borderline depressing tones. <laughs> like, I love a gritty game. And I think I also got that um, from from both of those games. And also just complete freedom of choice and really uh, the ultimate form of player agency where your character doesn't talk, but you've got a million options and you really kind of craft uh, your player uh, from the very start. I was obsessed with that. So, um, yeah, those had to be my number one. Yeah, having gone back to your channel uh, and seeing how you kind of got your, uh, I don't know if you got your start with Fallout, but that does not surprise me. <laughs> right. I spent a lot of <laughs> yeah. time talking about Fallout 4 uh, and New yeah. Vegas actually forever ago uh, in 3 to a lesser dis- extent, yeah. but yeah. Very cool. Well, for me, uh, my list is bookended with two Elder Scrolls games. Skyrim is my favorite Bethesda game of all time. I'm probably not alone on that front. I just have um, this... D- very two very distinct memories playing Skyrim. One is when you first are released into that world after you know the dragon comes and attacks you and you uh, you get out alive. Just being blown away. I'd played open world games before, but I had that experience all over again. Of just like, are you kidding me? This is I can go anywhere in this world. It's up it, it, at the time it was beautiful. I actually think Skyrim is still pretty gorgeous. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the time it was pretty unbelievable. So just being let loose on this world to do whatever I want, I could you know, craft whatever I want, kill whoever I wanted, make friends with whoever I wanted. Um, And then going into the first, um, I'll call it a dungeon, but it was more just like a cave that I found. And again, just being like, this feels very handcrafted, very um, well-made. And you're telling me there's an entire uh, just mountain range slash valley slash world of these caves and caverns that I get to explore and loot and discover um, and that feeling never really died down for the, my entire playthrough of that game. I think I spent 60 hours in it, which actually isn't a lot for Skyrim. And I feel <laughs> like if I were to go back and play it again, I would be able to discover stuff I, I never saw the first go around. So just love Skyrim. Amazing game. It's genuinely one of those, those games where you can pick up um, now almost 10 years later. This year will be the 10 year anniversary in November and um, find a brand new experience unless you're someone that 100 percent of it. Yeah, and I wasn't, and I would make a totally different type of character. That's the other thing, like, you know, the type of character you want to play just totally shapes how you go through that world, and um, really fantastic stuff. Awesome. What a great list. Yeah, 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 that was a lot of fun. Uh, We'd love to know what your uh, favorite Bethesda games are. Drop us a comment uh, if you're watching on YouTube, or uh, heck, send us an email, or uh, anything like that. And speaking of email... We are going to get into our reader mail, uh, but we are first going to take our second break. Uh, So that was a lot of fun. Again, let us know your favorite Bethesda game. We'll see you in just a minute. And we're back. Thanks for sticking with us till the end of the show. We are now going to dig into our mailbag. Thanks to everyone who wrote in. Again, if you want to have us discuss your question, the email address is preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. And this week, we got a question from Tom. Tom, thanks for writing in. You asked, hi guys, big fan of the podcast. I've recently been struggling to get invested in and finish some of the more recent games I've bought and played. Do you tend to power through any games you can't quite get into or do you just move on? Thanks guys. Jackson, what do you got to say? 
Um, like Josh said, thank you, Tom, for the um, for the question there. This is uh, something that I always think about and uh, struggle with. I'll put one game down for one reason or another and then just not touch it or come back to it when I'm feeling better. And this may sound counterintuitive, but to me, I don't think you should keep playing a game that you've bought and you're just like, Ugh, I've hit this absolute wall and I don't want to play it. Like, I think it's genuinely good to make a conscious decision in your mind to say, I'm putting this down and I'm going to come back to it when I'm more willing to play it. Now, I, I know that's counterintuitive to what you're saying, but uh, for me, I, I try not to power through games because then I just don't enjoy them. And then what's the point? So I really do think it's best to put them down and come back when you're ready. Yeah, same here. I used to complete almost every game I started and it eventually just drove me nuts. The, one of the first games I remember thinking that I just can't sit through this anymore was a uh, a game actually a lot of people love, Okami. I played it recently on the the HD version and it just got off to such a slow start. And I was like, this game doesn't feel like it's respecting my time. I've played it for like 10 hours and I don't feel like I've gotten started. So I put it down and I have no regrets about that. Another one I did recently was a little bit, uh, not Little Big Planet, what was Sackboy's Big Adventure. Looked like it was right up my alley, started it, was not enjoying it. And I bought the physical version, thankfully. And I was like, you know, I could probably get some pretty decent trade in on this at GameStop. So I just took it back and traded it back in and uh, no regrets there either. I do, if if I ha if I feel a game has something to offer me in terms of my perspective on games, or if it's like a history lesson for me and I'm not enjoying it, I, I may finish a game for those reasons. But if I'm just not enjoying the gameplay and it has no other value for me, yeah, I put games down. Right. And uh, one more thing you just made me, uh, reminded me of, if it's a game that offers a lot of different activities like Valhalla, for example, um, and you're realizing that it's this, it, it, it's easy or sorry, it, it's smart to parse out why you're not liking it. If there's one activity you can avoid and just do the things that you like, try that. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Tom, for the question. Hopefully that uh, made you feel a little bit better about putting down games that you might not be enjoying. Uh, play what you like. You know, that's the simple answer from me. Mm -hmm. So with that, we are going to wrap it up. Thank you again for sticking with us through the entire show. Again, if you're listening on any of the audio platforms, please uh, subscribe there and drop us a, a review before we sign off, Jackson. Oh, and I should just mention one more time, if you want to write in, again, it's preloadedpodcast at gmail.com. Jackson, anything you want to plug on your channel before we sign off? Um, so Josh, actually pretty quiet on my channel until uh, next week, but I am working on a big death loop video. So yeah, I hope you guys are excited to see that in a, exactly a week. Cool. Yeah. And I am working on a death loop video as well, but that did get postponed because Game Informer has a huge drop of info that I'm going to incorporate. But in the meantime, I'm working on a, a kind of a mini uh, Kena Bridge of Spirits preview. So look forward to both of those. Uh, it may be a little while, maybe a week or so before I post either. But um, in the meantime... Uh, thanks for listening to Preloaded. We will see you next week. Bye, guys.